now on to lighting. Uh, this is a great picture of the uh, South Face Eco Office that actually shows some of the concepts that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and and it, <clears throat> you know, it actually shows the south facing windows, whoops, let me try to show, along here that you can see. They have a, an interior light shelf. They have shading on the outside as well. The um, glass that's on the lower part here is, is often called vision glazing or view glazing. Its, its main purpose is to give the people uh, in the space a, a view to the outside. The upper glass is the daylight glazing, and the light can come in, uh, and in the, the summertime, it'll bounce off the light shelf and reflect off the ceiling, and you can kick natural daylight deep into the space. And you'll notice that most of the artificial lights, or in this case, all the artificial lights are turned off because there's such good natural daylight. Um, so these are some of the strategies that, we'll, that we kind of talked, uh, talked about earlier under the envelope section, kind of in, in a applied situation. Uh, in terms of the code, what we've um, found through our research and through our programs is, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of times it's it's technology that needs to be applied in an intelligent way. One of the things that we found is that vacancy sensors, which are manual on but automatic timeout and then turn off, um, tend to save more energy than occupancy sensors. Most people know what occupancy sensors are. You walk in, the lights go on, you you leave, and then they go through a timeout and shut off. Um, vacancy sensors work really well in a space that has natural daylight. If there's adequate daylight just for people to walk through, um, there's no need to turn on the artificial lights, where um, if those controls were occupancy sensors, the lights would come on whether you needed them or not. So that's a big thing. Occupancy sensors make a lot of, uh, a good application would be places that don't have natural daylight, sometimes restrooms and things like that. Um, the code is also very big on giving people the ability to adjust light levels in a space. So at least you know, off, on, and then something in between, you know, roughly halfway uh, light levels is uh, what the code is going to require. Um, as we talked about earlier, certain spaces require daylight, and the light fixtures in those need to have automatic daylight controls. Um, the other thing the code has always been very strong on is automatic shutoff, and that could be in the space itself, meaning no one's in the space, the lights shouldn't be on, but also in the entire building. So the building needs to be, uh, when the building is unoccupied, um, the lights need to be turned off. And that can be done based on a time clock. It can be done based on um, even getting a signal from a security system. Like you're the last person, you set the alarm, and that sends a signal, shut off the lights uh, in the building. Uh, and then uh, we say, uh, Joey, do you remember the acronym KISS, um, the KISS principle? I, I do. I know it very well. My, my dad was in the military. I knew a lot of these uh, acronyms. So this, one this, is, this one you can say out. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep it simple, uh, stupid. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Um, we have found buildings that had lighting controls that were very sophisticated, but frankly so complicated, nobody knew how to use right. them. And the result is that you end up essentially with some default light setting that is not appropriate and or the lights get left on because they're so complicated nobody has, knows how to use them. So I would say in general err on the side of making it something that um, people in the room can go in and intuitively figure out. Um, and overly complicated lighting control systems seem like a great idea, but when that person's on, the only person that knows how to run them is on vacation, you know, chaos ensues. Um, the other big comment is, um, Verify or little letter commission the controls to make sure that, that they are functionally performing as they're intended to. And so uh, things like occupancy sensors can be adjusted and things like that. Those, those are critical and the code is going to require that. Uh, overall, some of the big changes uh, in the lighting code. Uh, one of the big things is um, ASHRAE used to say uh, you didn't have to bring it up to code if you relamped 49% of the lights, but now basically anything more than about 10%, they really want you to bring it up to code. It's just that lighting has such a fast payback and offers such a great uh, energy savings opportunity. Um, in general, because of technologies like LED, we're going to see about a 15 to 20% reduction 
in the amount of wattage you're allowed to have to basically provide the same amount of light. So the lighting power density tables have gotten more strict, but I always remind people that the lighting section of the Energy Code was, was created by the Illuminating Engineering Society, so the folks that know all about lighting and know what's available. And um, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, in general, I think we've covered a lot of these other uh, features that are in the code. So one thing about these two is I will say that, that ASHRAE and IECC, in the end, have you doing very similar things, but their language in many cases is quite different. So the way they describe it, it can be quite different, but the overall effect is generally pretty comparable. Um, in general, uh, what is covered by the, the code, um, basically lighting used inside your building, lighting used outside your building, and what other lighting is there? Well, um, <laughs> basically where we say, if it's lighting that goes through your meter, then the code applies. Um, there are certainly some exceptions, uh, any kind of emergency safety lighting that's required. Uh, you know, emergency lighting that's normally turned off is only gonna come on in the power outage, that kind of stuff. That does not count against your lighting budget, and we'll talk more about that. Um, under ASHRAE, they're not trying to regulate lighting within dwelling units um, of buildings, but the IECC does. Um, they require that it meets the same, you know, um, in the 15 code, it's the 75% uh, efficient, 75% of the bulbs have to be efficient. And uh, certain things like uh, gas. So we're not gonna follow the code exactly, in this presentation. So to say, we're looking at lighting used on the inside. And there's three steps here. Figure out what your budget is. Your budget is not in dollars, but it's in wattage. Come up with a design that does not exceed your budget. And, um, and then make sure your controls meet the control requirements. And then you do basically the same thing. So for interior lighting, there's two ways to figure out your budget. One is the quick and dirty method. That's building area. And the other is, is the same concept, but it's, it's, it's a lookup, it's a square footage times a table value, but it's done on every single space or room, if you will, in the building. And so the, that's a more detailed approach. Um, the, the, the takeoffs take longer, but almost always you're allowed to get some bonus wattage. And it, it usually, the space by space approach usually results in a bigger budget for the effort. Um, and then, of course, your, your actual installed design cannot exceed your, your budget. Um, the building area method, again, this is the quick and dirty. It's the idea this is a retail building. We're going to go look it up and get the answer. It, uh, here is the entire thing. We don't necessarily have every commercial building in it. Try to find the one that's a good fit. Um, if it's a 10,000 square foot office building, go over here and you go, okay, 10,000 square feet, office is 0.82 watts per square foot, 10,000, we get a budget, as long as your interior lights add up to be no more than 8,200 watts, that's, that's how the game is played. You'll notice that for a uh, different type of occupancy, such as retail, you're allowed higher watts per square foot, which is different types of the warehouse is definitely on the lower end. It's allowed to be six, six. So we have been doing code for you know, a couple decades now, and um, I think when I started, offices were about two watts per square foot. So the technology has really increased uh, and, and improved, and this is you know we can we can light something today for a fraction of the wattage it used to take. Um, okay. The other approach, the more detailed approach, space by space, same concept, just much longer tables. <laughs> and uh, you gotta figure out the area, of basically every one of these different color spaces in here and multiply them by the appropriate lookup. And I'm just gonna say, it's, it sounds like a, a fit for a spreadsheet, but the best fit for doing this is absolutely to use ComCheck. So ComCheck has all the table values built in and uh, definitely will make your life easier. Here's just an example of one little section of a table, and you can see, you know, um, I don't know, different uh, different lookup values, different lighting power densities based on different types of occupancy. A restroom, 
is 0.98 watts per square foot. A stairwell is 0.69 watts per square foot. You know, just sort of different answers um, for the different lookups. One of the things we like to say for the effort is you, a lot of times, you can potentially be eligible for what I like to call bonus wattage. <laughs> bonus wattage, if you use decorative uh, luminaires, you can get uh, up to one watt per square foot in that space. Retail, they get, I call it the 1,000 watt signing bonus. And then um, depending on what you're selling in different areas, you get more watts per square foot, depending on what your retail product is. Uh, <clears throat> if you go this approach, you can have more sophisticated controls that will allow you bonus wattage. Um, so, for example, if you are using a continuous dimming control for the lights in your retail sales area, you can get 10% additional wattage, just as an example. Um, and there's also, I'm not gonna go too deep in the, there's also a, uh, it's called room cavity uh, ratio, basically a geometric adjustment. If you've got a certain type of space with high ceilings, you know, we're gonna give you a little bit of extra wattage because um, based on where the fixtures are located. So based on the geometry of the space, and it's essentially the perimeter around the space divided by the area of the space times the, this um, uh, height between the fixture and the work surface times two and a half. Anyway, if you can show that your space is higher than whatever the threshold is um, for that type of space, here in open office, uh, it calculates the threshold of 4.1, excuse me, a, a room cavity ratio of 4.1. You've exceeded the four, and so therefore you would get 25, uh, excuse me, 20 percent additional wattage. So it just kind of has, it's, it's sort of a nod to certain architectural spaces that need a little extra help. Um, there is also a number of types of lighting that you might see in a building that, inside a building, that do not count against your budget. These are sort of uh, exempt from the code, if you will. They tend to be more process oriented. Things like display lighting or lighting, you know, for your dental, I'm going to, we're going to do a root canal on you, we're, uh, but we're not going to um, we're not going to regulate the light fixture used for that. You know, um, lighting for food warming, stuff like that. Lighting to keep non-humans alive. That would be like a reptile Chicken. exhibit. Yeah, chickens. Yeah. So again, it's more process lighting. Exit signs are just exempt. A lot of times, these lights are exempt from counting against your budget, but they do potentially have to have a separate control, like display lighting. But anyway. None of these lights count towards your budget. I always remind people, though, that the owner still has to pay for them. So it behooves you to make sure that everything is efficient and therefore, you know, LED is a good choice. Um, the basic rules for how you count fixtures, essentially, you know, it's what is that fixture going to draw? And, um, it, you know, with like screw-in incandescent fixtures, or screw-in, rather, can fixtures and things like that, it's not the bulb that you screw in, it's what the fixture is rated for. Um, with anything with a ballast, it's, it's actually how much energy does it pull. So that works in your favor. And then track lighting kind of has its own set of rules. I have a quick example here of a room. I'm not going to go too deep in, into, into it, but you know, here's the old classic three, four foot fluorescent T8s. Each bulb is 32 watts. You know, so you think, oh, 3 times 32 is 96, but the reality is with an electronic ballast, it only pulls about 89, 90 watts. So that's only going to count as 90 watts. So 90 watts times 8, and you get that wattage. The can lights, again, it's based on the wattage of the fixture, not the bulb you screw in. And the track lighting, you can use a certain amount per foot. So anyway, in this case, if these were all your light fixtures in your, let's say this is your whole building, and these were all your light fixtures, and it added up to 1650 watts. As long as your budget was at least 1650, you passed it. Um, in terms of lighting controls, wow. Um, kudos, because they're trying hard. You gotta give them A for effort for trying, but they, they kind of failed in terms of making it really complicated. <laughs> um, basically, what they're saying is, they want to have the right kind of controls in a given space. And so um, there are these columns, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, of sort of control features that you want. 
And depending on what's happening in a certain space, it may be a required uh, item, it may be an option like pick one or two of the other, or it may be this is not required at all in this situation, um, and but these other ones are required, or so on. So I'll give an example over here. I have a cafeteria uh, in a dining area cafeteria, and it says, okay, you're allowed 0.65 watts per square foot. There's your room cavity ratio. A local control, that means a control in that space is required, okay? Something that turns the lights on and off in that space. That makes sense. There is this um, column B or C. It says add one or the other. Basically pick one or the other. And you either need to have only manual on or no more than about half the lights could be automatically turned on. So they do not want all the lights to automatically turn on. Then the next one um, is bi-level lighting. What this means is they want some additional light level between full on and full off. And so that's required. And then E and F uh, have to do with controls for daylighting. If daylighting is required in that space, then so, uh, and, and assuming the size of the cafeteria meets that criteria, those are required. Um, <clears throat> G is not required, and they want you to pick one of H or I. And um, they have to do with shutoff capability when nobody's in the room. Either at least half the lights have to shut off, or all the lights. So that's kind of what, what that can work as. Um, oh, I'm sorry, half the lights off is G. That's not an option. Either all the lights go off, which is H, or you have some sort of a, a time clock control. So anyway, it's a, it's a great concept what they did. It's definitely complicated the way they laid it all out. So it's really good. They're trying to, to kind of make you be thoughtful in how to apply lighting control. Um, and this is just these columns. I'm going to go very quickly. They want a local control. Uh, that means in that space, um, they want at least one light switch. And there's a rule, depending on the size of the space, they want at least one light switch for every 2,500 square feet. Um, they also say um, restricted to manual on. You know, basically, it can't be all the lights turned on. Um, partial automatic light, you know, up to half of the lights can be turned on. And then bi-level lighting, here's a you know, kind of a, here's one example with that old, with that three lamp fixture where one light switch turns on all the middle bulbs, the other light switch turns on all the outer bulbs. So you have one third light level, two thirds light level, and of course full on. That would satisfy them. But you only have to technically have one halfway. Um, the automatic daylighting control capability, again, this is just where it makes a uh, certain amount of wattage of light fixtures in a daylit zone, we want those to be automatically dimmed based on available daylight. Details on this, um, these diagrams are in the ASHRAE code, the same diagrams are in the IECC, the same requirements for side lighting or, or top lighting. So you can do it with side lighting, you can do it with top lighting, uh, roof monitors, skylights, same kind of handle. Here's skylights. Um, so any light fixtures in the daylight zone of this skylight would need to have a responsive control. Uh, G is half the lights are going to be turned off within 20 minutes of nobody in the room. H is all the lights are going to be turned off within nobody in the room. And I have the whole idea of the buildings unoccupied or the spaces unoccupied. <coughs> Shut off. Uh, finally, there's a couple of um, just requirements for certain types of lights that are exempt, that they can be uh, exempt from counting against your budget, but they have to have more control. And for exterior lighting, same concept, going really fast here, but essentially figure out what your budget is. It's based on what lighting zone type you have, and the zones range from very, very high urban, you know, situation zone four. Zone three is most commercial buildings. Zone two is kind of a residential uh, neighborhood area. Zone one is the, you know, the, the buildings and parking lots of national parks. And zone zero is the middle of the woods. <laughs> so any lights in the middle of the woods. Um, and again, as you saw before, there are certain exterior lights that are exempt, but they generally have to have their own control. And the only thing that's kind of unique here is, um, you figure out your lighting zone. So let's say we're zone three for outside. 
we automatically get 750 watts. That's like our signing bonus. And then based on what we have, so we've got 1,000 square feet of parking area, so you multiply it by the watts per square foot. You've got you know, walkways, you've got plaza areas, you've got a main entrance to the building. And there's different ways to ca calculate this stuff, but this is all wattage that you add up, and it makes your budget, and you can, you can distribute your, your light fixtures however you want to. So this is called, sometimes called tradable surfaces, as opposed to non-tradable surfaces, which are generally feature lighting, and we like to call this use it or lose it. So for example, if you decide you want to light your building facade, um, you can get 0.15 watts per square foot for lighting, say, the front of the building. But you can't use any of that wattage in the parking lot. You have to either use it on that building facade or, you know, don't use it at all. So that it's not like you get, you can't sort of, you know, game the system. Here. So either you use it to light that element or that feature or you just don't get credit for it. So this is non-tradable. And as you can probably imagine, when should exterior lights be off, you know, during the daytime? So you, um, you, you typically are looking like a photo cell in today in conjunction with a, a time clock because the new thing that's in both codes is this idea of curfew lighting. And curfew lighting is basically saying, look, we want when it gets dark, more or less, let's say, all the lights to be on. But there's a point at nighttime when we should be able to reduce the outdoor lighting levels. And you just have to reduce the power by 30%. So you could shut off every other light fixture or you could do something else. Um, and the, the default hours are midnight to 6. You can adjust those accordingly. But um, the idea is that we're going to get additional savings because we don't need full lighting probably at 3 in the morning. And there's always exceptions to virtually any statement that we make about lighting or some exceptions. Um, parking garages have requirements and control requirements as well. Um, and a lot of it just kind of has to do with the, 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 uh, the square footage and the distances we're talking about. Um, nothing major crazy here, but just, you know, again, guidance for how to design uh, parking garage lighting controls. Um, and then I think I mentioned this, that basically... Functional testing is, is sort of a crude form of commissioning that um, needs to be done, particularly on, they want to show as-built final uh, drawings need to be provided within 90 days of substantial completion. And the main thing here is that we want to make things, sure things like occupancy sensor controls are um, calibrated correctly and working properly and timeouts are set properly and all this kind of stuff. So um, anything, of course, with daylighting controls, it's really important to make sure they work. Um, I've said this before. I'll say it again. <laughs> ComCheck is your friend. It is the most clear way to show uh, compliance with the energy code. It is just the right way to do it, especially on lighting. It's, it's just, you know, transparently the same as the thing. You don't, have to, you don't even have to own the code. You can just use ComCheck. Um, one other thing is that um, ASHRAE has uh, some power requirements, and um, one of the ones that I want to make sure people are aware of is that <clears throat> this is something that is not always the most popular uh, fee, uh, uh, requirement, but in, an, in, an op in a private office, in a conference room, in, in certain types of break rooms and workstations, classrooms, what they want is that about half of the receptacles to be automatically switched. And the idea is they're trying to address plug loads. Plug loads are a very big deal. And the idea is that you, you have something that when the building's unoccupied, um, something, let's say, plugged in the lower uh, outlet is going to be switched off where the upper plug is going to stay on. So, you, you know, obviously... It's trying to control occupant behavior, which is challenging, but it, it's addressing, or it's trying to address this um, whole issue of, of plug loads being very, very dominant. Um, there's also some stuff about monitoring the electrical energy use. The, um, switching over to the other code, there's really a lot of similarity, but just like I said, very different language. One thing that's, I'll try to point out some of the more substantial differences. Dwelling unit lighting. 
uh, is regulated. 75% of the light fixtures have to be efficient. Um, the control requirements actually end up being very comparable. They specifically spell out occupancy or vacancy would meet this as well. Requirements in 12 spaces, and it's again, things that make sense, classrooms, conference rooms, break rooms, and so on. Um, and so uh, some of those are better suited for occupancy sensors. Uh, some of them with daylight are much better suited for vacancy. The other requirements that are comparable, um, the shutoff controls, again, with always some exceptions, daylight controls, again, with some exceptions, and um, control location. Um, and again, the same tables and charts for daylighting that we saw before, similar list of exempt light fixtures, as long as they have their own control, and um, exterior lighting, again, very comparable to what ASHRAE did. Uh, they still spell out exit signs need to be a maximum of five watts per, per, per face. It, that used to be a 90.1. I think they figured most people are using LED anyway, so um, that's probably not a big deal. Um, again, two different ways to calculate a budget, space by space, or building area. So very comparable in that regard. And then finally, um, outdoor lighting controls that don't count against your budget, and they only have four lighting zones. So um, that's pretty much about it for the lighting section. When it comes to the last main section we're going to talk about today is, is heating and cooling. Um, there, there were some changes that, that occurred in this um, in, in ASHRAE, um, mainly, nothing really earth shattering, mainly that they just started um, putting in some requirements for things that were previously unregulated. So there's always been tables and tables and tables of equipment minimum efficiency, and those are still there. Uh, and they've added a few different types of uh, equipment uh, or revised some, some efficiency values. Um, things got more efficient. Uh, and probably the new thing is this idea of commercial walk-in coolers and commercial refrigeration being addressed and looking at some of the newer control features like DDC um, being applied in more applications. Um, I'm going to jump down and kind of say, what do the two codes have in common? Uh, one very obvious thing, both require load calcs. Both have equipment efficiency tables. Uh, I'll note that the IECC tables were deleted and replaced with the ASHRAE tables for Georgia, just to be consistent. We didn't want an air conditioner to fail under one code and pass under another. Um, ducts have to be done correctly. They have to be sealed, they have to be insulated, and here's a really important tested imbalance. There's really not much to trade off. The only um, kind of calculation that's required is uh, there's a fan motor power calculation. This has been in the code that sort of says we don't want to have ducts that are too small trying to move too big of air. So uh, to limit fan power, um, is a good thing, and so it sort of means you have to have a big enough duct so your friction is, is manageable. Um, and basically, again, automatic shutoff, um, setback, and, and, and a degree of commissioning. One thing that ASHRAE has that the other code doesn't is ASHRAE says, look, for there's a lot of commercial buildings that are light commercial that are pretty simple mechanical systems. So if they can meet a, a prescriptive list of 18 items, if they can tick the box, yes, 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 not applicable, um, then they're automatically going to comply. It only applies to 25,000 25, square foot and under buildings and two-story or less, but there's a lot of buildings that would meet that. So without going into too much detail, single zone systems, you got to meet any kind of variable airflow requirements. Cooling is your standard stuff, packaged or split, they are evaporatively cooled. Generally, you're going to find economizers are required that you can do some things to exempt out of that. Um, heating is, again, pretty standard equipment. Split system, heat pump, gas, electric, no crazy steam systems, but hydronics okay. Uh, and then um, there are some energy recovery requirements if you have enough exhaust air. Uh, economizers just kind of showing that, for example, if you're in climate zone 3A, you can put equipment in that is at least 27% more efficient, and you can therefore not have to meet um, 
not have to have economizer controls. So in general, economizer controls are required. This is where you're saying the outdoor conditions are adequate. Instead of running the compressor, uh, we're going to just provide a lot of, we're going to flush the building without 100% outside air and get free cooling. Um, uh, control requirements, uh, you don't want to, you, you know, your thermostat has to either be manual switch from heat to cool or have a five degree dead band. Your heat pump has to not run its resistance heat unless the outdoor temperature is below 40. And that's uh, a really critical thing. So we're look, usually looking for an out, outdoor thermostat lock, lockout. Can't do any reheat in, um, in this simple commercial buildings. And basically, you know, the, when you read the control requirements, anything bigger than like a, a, a package unit in a motel room, anything bigger than that, 15,000 BTUs and up, uh, is going to require more or less a seven-day-a-week programmable time clock. That's what you get. Um, pipes uh, need to be insulated, and the insulation needs to be protected from the weather. Ducts need to be insulated and sealed, and here's the big one. They need to be balanced. This is important. And they said within industry standards, that's 10% of the design. So that's a critical thing. Um, outside air and exhaust. Uh, need to have dampers, um, and we don't want two pieces of equipment in the same room, one heating, one cooling, so you want to have what's called interlock. Uh, optimum start is required on bigger systems, uh, 10,000 CFM and up. That's where you basically, your building knows or your controls know that, you know, it's cold Monday morning. It's going to take longer to recover on Monday morning from being set back all weekend than it did, say, Wednesday morning. So just smart controls that can handle that. And then demand control ventilation is a brilliant idea where we're, we're going to, and mainly it just gets applied in more circumstances. So if you've got a room with highly variable occupancy, like a meeting, uh, cafeteria space, whatever, um, usually you want to have some sort of carbon dioxide sensor that um, will throttle ventilation um, to, based on the needs of the space. Uh, and then there's some requirements for door switches uh, for shutting off the HVAC system. Uh, that's the simple system. If you can't meet the simple system in ASHRAE, you go to the more complicated version. There's always some mandatory requirements. We've talked about some of these. And um, then you have a set of, if you have this in your building, read here and follow the rules. If you don't have this in your building, you can ignore it. For example, Heat rejection equipment. If you have a cooling tower, come here and read the rules around cooling tower. Otherwise, skip it. And um, there's that little man calculation I was talking about earlier. And you know, it, this is in the this has been in the code. The, what's different in the other code? Basically, um, as we said, load calcs are still required. Um, a lot of the same content here that you saw before, demand control ventilation, walking coolers. So a lot of overlap in terms of scope. Um, Georgia did make a few amendments to the IECC on the commercial chapter. Uh, like I said, we're going to use the same equipment tables that are in 90.1. So uh, you know, we're effectively using the, the same charts in both codes. Um, we had some feedback about the kitchen hood requirements were pretty onerous in the 15 codes, so those were deleted. Um, you are allowed to use spray foam as a duct sealant. Um, there was an economizer exception that's in 90.1 that was not uh, in the IACC for computer rooms, so that was, that was accepted. Um, a little clarification on some pump isolation stuff, a limit of renewable energy in your modeling. And here's an interesting one. Some people that were commissioning people didn't like using the word commissioning, so it's been substituted in Georgia with the word functional performance testing, which is really all it actually is. And then um, lastly, uh, if you go the 2015 compliance or, or path, you have to do everything we've talked about, but then you also have to pick one bonus thing. So there's a list of six items on here. Two of them are more efficient HVAC equipment or a dedicated outdoor air system, which I think is a very good idea. Those are two options. You can also have a more efficient lighting system than minimum code, or more effective, efficient, enhanced lighting controls, or you can do renewable energies, 
or if you use a lot of hot water, a more efficient water heating system. So you have to do, I like to say, you know, when you're all done, you're not all done. You have to do one more thing. And you pick one of these six items here. Um, and then finally, the last thing I really want to pitch is that we have uh, these great resources. And there's where you can find them on the South Face website, education courses, energy codes. And this one item over here called the Georgia Commercial Energy Code Field Guide. It's a pictorial user's guide. Um, much more easy and fun to read than the actual code itself. And so, Joey, with that, I think I'm going to wrap. Any comments or any questions? Thanks so much.